mute. You're on, Jim. Okay. They're coming through. Yes, it looks good. Do you see it? Coming through? Okay. And we're off and running. Okay, before we get into the hospitals a whole lot, I want to talk a little bit about the state of medicine at the time. Uh, obviously, very primitive compared to today. Uh, Bloodletting, um, cupping, uh, the ideal way to treat a chest wound was thought to be uh, cut the uh, injured person open and let them bleed more because that would flush out the poisons. Uh, so there were a lot of a lot of things that they had to deal with um, based on the technology at the time, not the least of which was the quality of the doctors. Uh, this is a typical class. Um, classes were held. Well, I, I guess the best way to put it is they sold a ticket, an admission ticket to get into the lectures. Uh, the proceeds from those admission tickets then was used to pay the doctors that were teaching. So they had five or six people on the staff. Uh, those who were taking the classes would take a class in anatomy, another one in uh, chemistry, one in pharmacology, one in surgery, and then one that really didn't have any bearing on uh, battlefield medicine, uh, women and children's diseases. And they would take this class for the equivalent of a semester, uh, take a little break and come back for a second semester and repeat the same five classes because they believed uh, if you repeated things often enough, you would learn them better. Having done that twice, you became a doctor. Uh, so it really was a very rudimentary education. They weren't much higher, uh, highly, more highly educated than the people they were treating. But that was what they had. Uh, a question often comes up, why so many amputations? Well, most of the, most of the uh, injuries at Gettysburg uh, were by the mini bullet. And, and, and we know what, what that does. Uh, there were some uh, artillery uh, injuries as well, some bayonet, not so much. But the mini bullet did a lot of damage uh, because it was a slow moving lead bullet that uh, hit anything, tissue or whatever, it would start to spin and shatter everything it came in contact with. And the, the picture on the right there is uh, a typical uh, bone injury that uh, couldn't be treated and had to be amputated. So the, the reputation the doctors at the time got as butchers was pretty unfair because, well, first of all, the technology didn't allow them to do a whole lot. And secondly, when you have uh, patients lined up at the door and you're working around the clock, um, trying to treat each one, uh, you really don't have a whole lot of time to do a lot of uh, anything other than, than amputations. Uh, I might point out that in, in Gettysburg, there were 21,000 wounded left behind when the armies left and 106 doctors. So you're looking at almost 200 uh, patients per doctor with varying degrees of, of very uh, vicious wounds. Uh, they did bring in civilian doctors uh, with very limited success. Uh, they weren't very highly respected by the surgeons on the uh, military staffs. Uh, Justin Gwinnell, the second court uh, surgeon, said all they wanted to do was eat the free food and cut something off. And uh, that was pretty much the, uh, the attitude that was uh, <clears throat> expressed by all the other surgeons. So, um, Pretty much the, 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 all they had to do, uh, all they had to work with was the uh, surgical staff that they had on hand. Uh, they also had to deal with selecting the hospital sites. Surgeons for the regiments or the corps or the division had the responsibility of, of establishing hospital sites. So it meant that they were in a strange area. So they had to go around and evaluate. Uh, this is a typical hospital. This is the Peter Frey farm, uh, which if you're familiar with the Gettysburg Visitor Center, if you come out the exit on the Tawny Town Roadside, this is the farm that's right ahead to your left. Uh, on that farm were the cops of trees and the bloody angle. So you can imagine uh, this hospital got a lot of, a lot of work. Uh, 
the criteria they set up for for uh, establishing hospitals was uh, something with a lot of room, which of course was a farm, uh, running water, uh, straw for bedding, uh, things like that, that that would would lend themselves to somewhat of a good hospital atmosphere. Uh, the un downside of it was that it, they used the barnyards a lot, and we know how sterile those were. So um, when a soldier was going to a, a, a field hospital, uh, many of them chose not to go for, for some obvious reasons. If their wounds were not uh, very serious, they would take their chances. The other part of the problem is um, many of the many of the hospitals were unofficial hospitals, so they uh, were staffed by the people that owned the farm. Uh, they didn't plan on having a, uh, 50 soldiers in their barn waiting for somebody to treat them. They didn't know how to amputate. They didn't have uh, any knowledge of sepsis. They didn't know uh, how to treat anything other than an animal wound or an animal injury. Had no supplies because nobody knew they were treating people. The, the only hospitals that were getting supplies in the initial stages were the official hospitals because they were the ones that were known to be there. But this is a this is a uh, one of the hospitals, and we'll talk about some individual hospitals and uh, some of the interesting human interest stories that came along with them. Uh, there were about two hundred hospitals uh, that I found, and there's probably more that I didn't catch up with. So uh, there's more information out there if anybody wants to. Uh, take that challenge. Uh, this is the David and John Blocker farm. Uh, it was initially used by the 17th Pennsylvania Cavalry uh, as a picket station uh, prior to the battle. Uh, of course, Blocker's Knoll, uh, the first day of fighting, was very uh, heavily contested, and the Confederates drove the Union Army out and pushed the 17th Pennsylvania Cavalry out of here and took over this hospital here, or this farm here, as a hospital um, owned by David and John Blocker, obviously. This is John Blocker's home, the father. David was the son. Uh, and it sits right about where it's sitting on the slide here, even though it's not the same picture, right at the entrance driveway to the main farmhouse. Uh, the story that's associated with this, or the most interesting story, uh, it concerned this man, uh, Lieutenant Colonel David Wynn from the 4th Georgia, who was killed. And on uh, uh, the July 1st uh, fighting and died at the, the Blocker farm. Uh, he was buried uh, over here in this general area around the orchard, which is not there anymore, but that, that's where the orchard was. Uh, and, and David Blocker maintained his grave and along with the other graves that were, were there. Uh, a few years after the war was over, the Wynn family came to Gettysburg to retrieve their loved one's body to take back home. And David Wynn said, I'm happy to give you the body, but it's going to cost you $10 because I need the money for the upkeep of the other graves. So $10 in those days was a pretty fair amount of money when you figure $13 was the average pay for a soldier so uh, per month. So it was a pretty significant amount, and they, they protested. And it involved um, this man, Rufus Weaver, uh, who, along with his father, uh, Samuel, was very instrumental in repatriating the remains of uh, Southern soldiers. And he got involved in negotiations with David Blocker and talked him down to $5. And Blocker said, but I'm keeping the lower jaw because it has some gold teeth in it. So he was getting a little mercenary about the whole thing. And finally, Rufus Weaver was able to talk him down to $5 flat out and gave the whole body uh, back to the Wynn family to to take back to uh, Georgia with them. But it was a kind of a, an ugly story on, on a blot on the Blocker farm and, and many people associated the mercenary part of it with all Gettysburg uh, uh, residents and it really wasn't the case. This is the John Cunningham farm, Confederate hospital out on Scott Road, uh, but it also treated uh, several Michigan men that you may be interested in. Um, and they treated them as you would be expected. They they treated both of the both sides fairly uh, reasonably uh, the same. But the Confederate, being a Confederate hospital, got preferential treatment with the barn, and they were put inside 
to give you out of the weather where your Michigan men were out here uh, in the field uh, exposed to the weather. After the uh, wounded were all taken to either Camp Letterman or to other general hospitals, uh, Cunningham maintained the graves on that farm for several years. Uh, one particular morning though, right, not long after the armies had gone, he went out to his barn to, to milk the cows and he found a, a young Confederate uh, soldier there, a deserter who had been treated there, had not gone when the rest of the army left. And uh, he was sobbing, I mean, hysterical. And Cunningham asked him, of course, what was wrong. And the, the young man said, well, I know you're gonna turn me into the Union Army when you see them and they're gonna kill me. So Cunningham reassured him he wasn't going to turn him into anybody. He wasn't going to, he wasn't going to be killed. And uh, the, the young boy stayed there for several days afterwards and then, and then left. And about two or three months later, Cunningham got a letter from him that said, you were right. Uh, the Union Army caught me, um, didn't kill me, and now I'm a Union soldier. So he switched sides uh, after Cunningham assured him that he would not be killed. This is the Daniel Lady Farm, and this is a good example of, of why they uh, chose farms. Here's, here's the barn uh, with the bedding in it. Um, you can go into the barn now, today, uh, and on certain occasions, the house is open. You can also go in and, and look around in there. But one of the young men who was treated there was, again, a Confederate, uh, Joseph Latimer, known as the boy major. He was 20 years old, I believe and who had been very badly wounded, uh, was brought to the lady farm out on Hanover Road. And when he got there, he found his older brother was the surgeon in charge. And it came upon the surgeon to take care of his younger brother and try to save his life. Ended up amputating his leg, uh, but was unable to save his brother's life. So it's one of the sad stories associated with some of these hospitals, or many of the hospitals, had their own sad stories. These are blood stains on the second floor. Uh, these were confirmed to be blood stains by the Buffalo Police Department, which was kind of an interesting story. They were Buffalo was um, having a murder trial, and the and the defense attorney said, uh, "This is a cold case. And those blood stains are from years ago, and uh, we think that when blood." ages, uh, it, it loses its capability of being determined to be blood. So the Buffalo Police Department, Luminol was just coming into, into fashion at the time, and they, uh, they decided they would try to find a place that had the oldest blood they could think of to see if it could be detected. And of course, Gettysburg was their choice. And they came to the Lady Farm and the Shriver House in town and did tests on these stains and proved that they were blood. So, of course, that went back to the uh, to the trial, and uh, the defense uh, withdrew their their uh, argument. If you go into the barn, you can go in, and if you take a left as soon as you get in, you can see these initials here, right here, A B E A B E three N C. Uh, this is Abe is not Abe Lincoln, by the way. It's uh, Aaron Eubanks, who was. Uh, a member of the third North Carolina. And many of these soldiers uh, carved their names and initials, kind of a Kilroy was here type of thing from World War II, more to stave off boredom than anything. Uh, they just they made, they made rings out of bones and things like that. But this is one that, with, uh, that was used, uh, or the barn was used uh, to collect a lot of the names of the young men that were, were housed and treated there. Lydia Leister Farm, uh, known better as Meade's headquarters, of course, um, back here in the house. Uh, the Leister Farm, the widow Leister, was, was, was there by herself with, with a daughter, I believe. Uh, Meade came in, and this is where the Council of War was held, the famous Council of War on the night of July 2nd, when Meade gathered his generals uh, and ask, should we stay and fight or should we retreat and fight another day? And the unanimous choice was, uh, obviously we'll stay and fight because the next day became uh, the culmination of the, of the three-day battle with Pickett's Charge. 
Uh, Lydia Leister herself, uh, this was her house after the fighting. You can see there's some dead horses here and some over here. She had 17 dead horses on her farm, which actually poisoned her well. So she had to have a new well dug. Uh, this is a blow up of the same picture. You can see some of the damage on the house. Um, but uh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I was trying to slide it over. But anyway, she said that she lost a heap in her words, and she was uh, telling the truth. The, the farm was used not only as Meade's headquarters, but was, let me see if I can get that back. Yeah, it was uh, Meade's headquarters, but it was also an ambulance staging area. Uh, it was used as a holding pen for uh, Confederate prisoners. Uh, so there's a lot of activity on, on the, the farm. Uh, she had a cow and a horse. She lost them both. Um, all her fences were used for firewood and and uh, whatever else it may have been used for. And uh, she just it took a long time to recover. And many of these people, by the way, did not recover from the damages on their farms and ended up uh, just locking the door and walking away. But she stayed. She became a little bit of an entrepreneur. All those dead horses on her, her farm, uh, she rendered the bones and sold them off to fertilizer companies. So she recouped a few of her losses. Um, that's that's the le leaser farm, I guess. There's not much more we can say about that. Oh, there was a, 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 a man who came a couple months later and said he couldn't stand to stay there very long because the stench was so bad. But this is Pennsylvania Hall. One of the two administration or two buildings was the administration building at the time on the uh, Pennsylvania College campus, now Gettysburg College, still there and still used. Um, became a Confederate hospital on the first day. The portico out here was used as the operating theater. Amputated limbs were thrown over these railings down here. When they gathered up so many of them, they would take them off and and either burn them or bury them. Uh, didn't get them all. After 30 or 40 years or so on a construction project, they did find some uh, remains uh, on, the, on the campus area. The uh, students were still in session. So many of them, uh, some left, but many of them stayed behind uh, to work as nurses uh, on the, on the, uh, with the hospital staff. This lady, Euphemia Goldsboro was from Maryland. Uh, she became one of the nurses. She was a Southern sympathizer. So she went to mostly Confederate hospitals in the Maryland area. Of course, Maryland and Gettysburg are very close together. Uh, she was known as Miss Effie to her, her patients because she was so compassionate and so loving and took care of them so well. They, uh, they had kind of adopted her. And, and when they left, left for general hospitals almost to a man, they gave her some kind of a token of their appreciation. They made her uh, rings. They made her. They wrote her letters. They, they made a little booklet of the their their time and at the uh, hospital and so on, uh, as a show of their appreciation. There's an example of of her uh, treatment of patients. Uh, this man, uh, Waller Tazewell Patton, at the Seventh Virginia was wounded and Pickett's charge was hit in the face with a cannonball. So you can imagine the damage that was done. Uh, his lower half of his face was gone. Uh, he couldn't eat, he couldn't uh, lie down or he would smother in his own blood. Euphemia Goldsboro, who was weighed about 95 pounds, sat back to back with Patton, strapped her body to his and each time he kind of teetered one way or the other, she would straighten him back up all night long. Um, she said her legs were in extreme pain by the time morning came. She was she couldn't uh, bend them at all. They were straightened out. Her, her back was hurting. Uh, but she, she did her job. And uh, unfortunately, Patton did not survive, which nobody thought he would. Uh, you may, may recognize the name here, Patton. He's a an ancestor of George Patton, General Patton from World War II fame. This is the Lutheran Seminary, the famous Lutheran Seminary with the cupola where both sides used it uh, extensively as an observation post. Uh, Schmucker Hall, uh, which is where the museum is now, but at this time it was a hospital, became a hospital, uh, a, a Union hospital on the morning of the first day. It's not far from McPherson's Ridge. 
Uh, this lower area was for the most severely wounded, and these upper floors were uh, for the lesser wounded, which proved to be fortuitous because we know on the 4th of July when it started raining, this basement flooded, and all the more able-bodied men come down and rescued uh, the men who were in the basement when the basement flooded. Later in the morning on the first day, when the 11th Corps was routed, this became a Confederate hospital, and the prisoners or the patients in there became prisoners of war, along with the Union surgeons. One of those who was treated here was Isaac Trimble. Now, Trimble was first treated out at the Cobain Farm on Harrisburg Pike, and then brought into town and was treated in a home on Chambersburg Street in the main part of, of town, right off the square. When the neighbors found out uh, Trimble was in their neighborhood, they were not very happy. And, and they caused such a ruckus that he was moved out to the Lutheran Seminary for treatment out there, along with a number of other uh, Confederate officers. Um, he was not a major, he was not a, uh, what you would call a, uh, a good patient. Complained about everything, uh, didn't like the food, uh, said it wasn't cooked properly, and, and just made a pain in the neck out of himself. So it's, it's not hard to figure out that when the railroads became operative again. Uh, he was one of the first ones that they uh, shipped out to Baltimore to get him out of their hair. So Trimble was treated here, but not very long. This is the George Spangler farm. This is a before picture. It doesn't look like this anymore, fortunately. This was in a pretty sad state of repair. It had been abandoned, it was used as a party site for college kids and, and whoever else. Uh, preservationists came along and worked on it, and this is what it looks like today, uh, looking at it from the opposite side. This, this side here is the back side of the barn. This is the front, obviously. Uh, this became the 11th Corps Hospital, uh, treated about 2,000 wounded, including Confederates. This whole area out here was shoulder to shoulder with, with uh, uh, wounded in the field. Just a bit off the picture here, that was an artillery park, an ambulance staging station. So this was a an extremely busy area. One of those who was treated here was this man, Private George Nixon, in 73rd Ohio, who was wounded and was trapped between the lines uh, when night came. Uh, Nixon, by the way, is a great great grandfather of President Nixon. So we have a number of connections uh, in many of these hospitals with uh, dignitaries of, of more recent times. But anyway, it, as he was lying out in the no man's land between the armies and and one of many who were out there uh, crying out for for uh, painkiller or calling for their mother or calling for water or whatever um, this man it was a friend of his Richard Enderlin who was a musician in the 73rd Ohio crawled out to find Nixon found him put him on his back and crawled back to the Spangler farm to get his friend treated uh, Nixon, unfortunately, did not survive, but Enderlin was awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions that day in, in rescuing uh, Nixon. Armistead was also treated at, at the uh, Spangler Farm. As you remember, Armistead from the Gettysburg movie with his hat on his sword that slid down over the sword a little bit. Uh, he, was, he actually got across the wall at the angle, but was badly wounded, was brought to the Spangler farm for treatment and placed in the summer kitchen and was doing reasonably well when uh, all of a sudden he took a turn for the worse, um, probably some kind of a, an embolism and uh, passed away in this, in this kitchen. Now you can go out to the farm, they have tours there, they do demonstrations, medical demonstrations in the barn. Uh, you can see inside the summer kitchen where Armistead was treated, you can't actually go in any further than they've got gates up that you can't really go in too far, but you can go in far enough to see what it looked like um, when Armistead was there. Black Horse Tavern, another good example of a, of a farm being used as a hospital and for the reasons that you would expect, lots of room, uh, lots of buildings to treat the people in. Um, Black Horse Tavern sits on Fairfield Road at the corner of Fairfield and Black Horse Pike. Um, off the uh, picture again, if you go kind of up this way, 
Uh, I'm standing right about at the edge of Fairfield Road. So if you go up, go up at about a 45 degree angle, that angles up and comes to a hill at the top, just above the barn here. Uh, that is the area where Longstreet's counterattack or counter march uh, started when they uh, were supposed to attack Little Round Top, and they got to this this uh, part of the of the route coming in and spotted the Signal Corps on the, on top of Little Round Top and and reversed their their uh, tracks and and came around a circuitous way. So that this area was a big contributor to what ended up taking place on Little Round Top. The Black Horse Tavern, as you can imagine, was a place for travelers to get a place to sleep. They could get food. They could get drink. And when the Confederate surgeons got there and they saw all these barrels of whiskey, which were in the inventory, they said, we've got to dump this whiskey because we're going to have enough problems treating these men without them being drunk and causing trouble. And they turned out that they, they regretted doing that because they ran out of uh, painkillers and anesthesia. So they had nothing uh to to help these men through their ordeal but again we talked about uh aaron eubanks putting his initials on the barn uh, at the lady farm uh one of the customs at the black horse tavern was for travelers to carve their names or their initials in the into the doors or the windowsills or the walls wherever they found a space uh one of the young confederates who was being treated here uh is said to have found his mother and dad's uh, names on a windowsill from years before. So he had a connection at that point. The uh, the comments sometimes that, that, that the Civil War was the last chivalrous war are, are exemplified here very well. Um, when the battle was over, of course, the Union Army came in, captured uh, the, the, the wounded men and the surgeons who were at Black Horse Tavern, made them prisoners of war. One of the surgeons for the Confederates said, we are out of all our supplies. We need help. What can you do for us? And the Union surgeon said, well, if you promise to come back, uh, we'll give you a wagon. You can go into town to the Sanitary Commission, get all the supplies you need, uh, and that should take care of you. And, and that's what he did. And he came back. And I often wonder, I've never been a prisoner of war, but I think if I was released, I'm not sure I'd have the honor to to go back to what I knew was not going to be a pleasant experience. But he came back with the supplies and they treated uh, those who were still unable to travel with the retreat. This man, William de Saussure from the 15th South Carolina was uh, one of the patients here who passed away. And he was buried about a quarter of a mile down Black Horse Pike back this way uh, in the family cemetery of the McClellan family. Uh, this is the entire cemetery. I'm looking at, at the, almost the whole thing from the upper corner. Uh, so it was not very big. This was a Revolutionary War soldier. And one of these two back here, I don't recall, I think it's this one, was also a Revolutionary War soldier buried buried here. But the saucer was uh, buried there for about a year, was uh, reburied somewhere on the way south probably around Hollywood Cemetery, I'm guessing, but there was no record of where it was. And he was dug up again and taken back to South Carolina. So this poor guy uh, went through three burials in, in his uh, time after he was uh, killed and died at the Black Horse Tavern. So that's another one of those weird stories that, that comes up when you're researching these things. This is the George Bushman farm out on Hospital Road. Union Hospital, but again, treated both sides. Um, established a tent city out in this area here and drew, had a street that went up between the tents. The one side of the street was the Union troops. The other side was the Confederate troops. And um, there was no record of any kind of uh, problems uh, associated with that. One of the people treated here was Lewis Powell from the second Florida, had a hand injury. You may recognize that name and that face became one of the Lincoln conspirators. Uh, his job was to assassinate uh, Secretary of State Seward. And he is the one who went in and, and uh, stabbed Seward several times, uh, didn't kill him, uh, wounded him pretty badly, uh, and was later hanged for being part of the conspiracy. But that took place on the, the Bushman farm. 
we talked about the farms being such good places for hospitals, but in town, we didn't have that space. We didn't have, in all cases, running water. There was no straw for bedding. Um, this is one of the hospitals in town. Most of the hospitals in town started out to be the larger buildings, uh, churches, hospitals, or uh, schools, uh, warehouses, uh, but it became so many wounded that it ended up going into uh, private homes as well. But this is the St. Xavier Catholic Church uh, in, in town, uh, treated uh, about 200, mostly Confederate, but some Union. We'll talk about that in another minute or so. Um, they were treated, they had the Sisters of Charity from Emmitsburg, Maryland there uh, as doing most of the treatment, along with uh, a number of volunteer nurses. Uh, as a show of appreciation, the church commissioned a stained glass window. There's a little closer view of it, uh, commemorating what the uh, Sisters of Charity did uh, in those uh, days and weeks following the battle. And of course, they're showing here the Union soldier, Confederate soldier, all being treated equally. One of the Union soldiers that was treated here was Henry Heidecoper from 150th Pennsylvania was wounded in the arm badly on McPherson Ridge the morning of the first uh, day of the battle. Uh, his arm was almost shot off. It was just hanging by a couple tendons. Refused to go get aid. He said, we need everybody we can get. Um, and they did at that point. So he continued to fight, was wounded a second time in the other arm, and then in the, th the leg for the third, third wound. Uh, and that one was the one that kind of convinced him he had to do something because he was bleeding pretty badly from that one. Um, strapped his arm down to his body around noon when the low and the fighting took place and walked about a mile and a quarter uh, in that condition uh, to the St. Xavier Catholic, Catholic Church where he was treated. Uh, the arm was obviously had to be amputated, um, but he survived the war. I didn't fight again, obviously. But he did survive the war and about 30 years later uh, received the Medal of Honor for his efforts uh, that morning uh, out on McPherson's Ridge. This is the site of the infamous John Burns, one of the great characters of Gettysburg. I love this guy because he's got so many great stories associated with him. Uh, this is not his house. This is a replacement house that sits on the footprint of his original house. Uh, and you probably know the story. He was the only civilian to fight at Gettysburg. He was about 70, 72 years old, World uh, War of 1812 veteran. Uh, on July 1st in the morning, heard all the ruckus out on the person's ridge, and he took his squirrel gun down, and he told his wife he was going to go out and see what was going on. And he got out there and fell in with the Iron Brigade, who gave him a better gun and ammunition. And he fought along with the Iron Brigade. Um, and the story gets kind of gray after that because John Burns is, is telling it. And there's a, uh, a lot of good reasons not to believe everything John Burns said. He said he killed three Confederates and nobody's disputing that because there's no way of knowing. Um, he was wounded. And here's a shot of him re recovering. But nobody knows how many times because when he told the story, it was anywhere from two to seven times he was wounded. Uh, so uh, you could kind of take your choice there. Uh, he was wounded badly enough that he, he couldn't make it home. So he went to a friend's home, not too far from where he was fighting, a, a family named Riggs on uh, Chambersburg Pike. And uh, when he got there, he found that the Riggs family had left and their house was full of Confederate wounded. So uh, it was a cantankerous old guy. So he said, I'm not going in with those Confederates. So he laid on the outside door to the cellar for several hours until somebody commandeered a wagon for him to take him uh, into town to his home, which really isn't that far, probably a half mile at the most. Um, and when he got there, as luck would have it for him, it was also being used by Confederate wounded. But since it was his, his house, he went in anyway. And he was treated there by a, a Confederate surgeon as he said in one story, another story said he had been treated out on the field by a Union surgeon. So again, uh, we take our choice. He also said that uh, a Confederate soldier stuck his gun barrel in through his window, his bedroom window, and tried to assassinate him, but he 
he missed him. Um, it's kind of an interesting story because his bedroom was on the second floor. So how that guy got up that high, I'm not sure, but uh, that's his story and he's sticking with it. He became known as the, the, the hero of Gettysburg because obviously being the only one who, who actually fought as a civilian, uh, so well known nationwide that when Abraham Lincoln came to Gettysburg to make his Gettysburg address, the dedication speech for the cemetery, he asked if he could meet John Burns. Uh, John Burns didn't ask to meet Lincoln. Lincoln asked to meet Burns. So the two of them went to a meeting at the Presbyterian Church that, that evening uh, in town. Burns is well enough known that he got his own statue, and not many people can say that. It's out right in the area where he fought. And I'm going to close with this story, and it's kind of ghoulish. Um, but it's an extremely interesting story. Uh, this is the Jacob Kime farm. Um, it's out by Harrisburg, I'm sorry, on Harrisburg Pike by Gettysburg High School, the new high school. Um, the day before the battle, the Kimes were warned by a Confederate officer that there was going to be fighting in their general area and they should leave the area for their own safety, which they did. Um, the night of July 1st, after a day of fighting, Kime, Jacob Kine himself came back, figuring there was going to be some damage, and he wanted to assess what it, what it was. He uh, was not prepared for what he saw. His farm was pretty much devastated already. Uh, his cattle were all gone. His crops were all trampled. Fences were down, as they always are on, on these places where they use them for firewood. Uh, inside the house, there was blood on uh, all the walls. Um, the linens had been torn up for, for bandages. His wife's dresses had been torn up for uh, bandages. Um, so he spent the night in the cellar and he said it was the longest night of his life because he didn't sleep at all uh, because of the wounded upstairs, uh, screaming in pain, calling out for their mothers, calling out for painkillers. Um, so he, he, didn't, he didn't stay after the first night. He left the next day and came back later and his farm was pretty much destroyed, and, and it's gone now. They had to raise all the buildings. There was nothing left of it, and it looks like this today. Uh, the high school was over here where you folks are, um, and this is where the story kind of takes a, a, a tragic turn, illustrating how, how war affects families so much, particularly mothers. Uh, William McLeod, 38th Georgia, was killed and buried by his manservant, Moses, who he had taken with him when he went to the army. Uh, Moses buried him and then walked back to Georgia to report to the family what had happened to uh, their son. Two years later, uh, Moses came back to Gettysburg, two years after the battle, not after the war, after the battle, and brought McLeod's brother-in-law, John, with him. And the two uh, disinterred McLeod and took him back home for burial. But when he got home with the body, Mrs. McLeod said, and Mrs. McLeod probably was uh, suffering from intense grief at that point, said, my son has been buried alone in the cold ground for two years. And I'm not going not gonna to allow him to be buried again alone until somebody in the family is, uh, passes away and we can bury them together. So for seven years, Mrs. McLeod kept her son's body in the parlor. That's the ghoulish part. Um, ironically, the one who died in the family next was John, his brother-in-law who had brought him back. And these two uh, were buried side by side in the family cemetery, uh, allowing uh, Mrs. McLeod to have some closure at that point. But it was a one of those strange stories that you don't think about so much. But that's my story, or several of them, and I, I want to thank you for your attention. And I would ask you, um, if you go to Gettysburg, look at these buildings a little differently now. Look at them as a, almost all of them are hospitals in some fashion, maybe an aid station or uh, a field hospital. But look at them and try to think what maybe happened in there. And maybe some of them you'll, you'll remember from this talk others that you won't know about until you get there, but um, we got to we got to preserve all that. It's, it's going to be lost. Much of it is already. So thank you very much, and I will go to the Q&A now.